have something wonderful in Jesus. Amen. Amen. It's just hard for me to sing about what all he's done without getting stirred up about it. You realize what he's done for you people? If you just really want to get, you know, every once in a while, every one of us gets bent out of shape and we think, well, it's this, this, that, and fully on the whole thing. And I, everybody else got blessed but me and you can't remember a blessing in the world and all that go back and remember what he did for you if you can pull the white flag up on Jesus I, go ahead but you retrace his steps I don't think you can do it God needs men and women today boys and girls and young people whose hearts have been touched Do you realize how hard the hearts are out there? I'm talking about the hearts of the preachers. They're so wrapped up in their own problems and their own misery. How can they reach out to others because they're hurting so bad themselves? Need to pray for them, not hate them. But, oh, that God would call up and give us pastors after his own heart. People who really care. One one reason that Steve Bell came here, and you know, Hagwish is a very restricted pulpit. Not too many people speak here. It's because I sensed in him a man with a pastor's heart. 
He loves the people he works with. He loves the people who come for help. He does what he can to help, he and his wife. And what a blessing it's been to sit under his ministry. Amen. Can't you tell when somebody who's ministering to you loves you? They don't minister condemnation. They may talk about some pretty strict, rough things that may make you uncomfortable, but you know they love you. Did you know that some churches all they minister is condemnation and guilt and shame on the people? That's what comes out of the pulpit. You're not measuring up. You're not right. You're not this. Well, that may be true, but you can say that if you love a person and they can accept it. But if you're just mad at them, it hurts, it cuts, it wounds. I praise the Lord. God is going to have the victory, people. Don't you believe that? Whichever way this thing blows, we're going to go with it. Amen? Amen. And the devil's going to have us on his back, whichever way he turns. Amen? Amen? I hope we can raise up enough warriors who give the devil fits. Uh, you've heard me say this before. I <clears throat> went. Uh, I used to fervently believe in the pre-tribulation rapture theory, and I'm not trying to push any theory on you. But I really believed in it. I left, believed in it so much I broke with my denomination, and I went to Dallas Seminary. I stopped 30 miles short of Mecca over in Fort Worth where the seminary is. I didn't get to Fort Worth. I stopped 30 miles short because I really wanted to study this doctrine of the pre-tribulation rapture that was taught in this place. And I was taught by some godly people who love the Lord and love the Word. And I learned many wonderful things. But you know, when I got into deliverance, uh, just a few years ago, it suddenly dawned on me, hey, what God's talking to you about is raising up an army, an army of warriors, an army of soldiers, and he's not talking about, an ev- he hasn't said a thing about evacuation. He's talking about a slug out. He's talking about arming men and women with spiritual power to slug it out with the devil and his forces right here on the earth. And I thought, oh dear. But that couldn't be right. Because we're going to rush out just in the nick of time. You know, I thought, I thought like many still do. And you're free to feel that way. But I want you to know I was where you were. And I even went through quite a bit of persecution to study that and to take that position. And um, fervently believed it. And then I found out that instead of us being hemmed up in the corner with the devil coming in for the kill and Jesus suddenly swooping in and rescuing us, you know, swish in the last minute we say, oh, boy, he just made it, you know. But you know what I think is going to happen now? I think we're going to have one of the awfulest battles you ever saw in your life. It's going to be a spiritual battle. It'll have some physical aspects, but the primary emphasis is going to be spiritual. There's going to be a small but determined army. They're going to give the devil fits all over this country and all over the world. They're not going to give up. They're going to resort to guerrilla fighting if they have to. And they'll come down and just cut his supply lines and everything else and cause so much havoc and confusion in the ranks of the enemy that when Jesus finally does come down and take us out, the devil's going to say, boy, I'm glad that bunch is gone. They were nothing but trouble from the word go. Everywhere I turned, they were they were nagging at me and after me. Now, I believe this is what's going to happen. Now, you believe what you want. I'm not going to fall out with you about it. God didn't call me to argue. He just called me to teach the truth and try to walk with him. But I, uh, you say, well, you must have read some of those books. Yeah, I have now, but I didn't read them before that. The thing convinced me was the fact that God was telling me to raise up a fighting army, not a Dunkirk. He didn't say a thing about Dunkirk, evacuating just in the nick of time, get everything out the best good. He talked to me about winning. And that's kind of strange with the world coming apart. God's raising up a victorious army, but <laughs> he's done it before. Our God's still the same, isn't he? Well, it's been a good good weekend. These days have been such a blessing. And I want us to talk about the fragmented soul. This may be new to some of you. Most of you have been introduced to it. It won't hurt you to review it if you know about it. And we're just going to go through it rapidly and give you some groundwork to study on. Let me say at the outset, the 
teaching about the fragmented soul is in its infancy. We have not begun to explore the depths of it. But it is a breakthrough. It's a major breakthrough, the same as loosing the spirits of God was a major breakthrough for deliverance people. And you need to be aware of it, not only for your own benefit, but so that you can explain it to some degree to others who ask you questions. Now believe me, you're not going to be able to answer all the questions of the critics. Some people were born in the objective case and the kickative mood. And they're just going to object and kick all the time. They just never, they're never going to be satisfied. You answer one question, they'll come up with three more. But there, there are people who are honestly questioning, honest questioners who are seeking the truth. Now you can work with them. And I'm going to give you a few seed things that we've found out. Uh, this thing is working remarkably well and it takes up where other things that we've learned have left off and it takes us deeper. Let me say this too. Deliverance is an unfolding revelation. Anybody who says I know all about it is an idiot. And you can quote me on that. I've been in it 11 years and I certainly don't know all about it. Anybody that deals with the demons knows how vast the store of uh, is that we don't know. We're just chipping away and the little bit we know has caused unbelievable havoc to the devil's kingdom. But we don't know all about it. If you meet somebody that says, oh, I know all about deliverance. Run. Those people are dangerous. They're a disaster going somewhere to happen. Because they, if they're that ignorant, they can do a lot of damage. The Bible says a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. That's because it can make an idiot out of you. You can presume to know what you don't know. Let's stay on solid Bible grounds that can be backed up with experience. That's, I'm, I'm kind of a pragmatist when it comes to this. That's a high, highfalutin term for me, and I, I want it to work. If it doesn't work, I don't care how nice it sounds. Fooey. I know that, we're, well, for instance, I know we're going to have pie in the sky by and by. But I want something for the nasty now and now. I'm having problems right now. I need some help right now. And I believe the promises about heaven, and we sang about them, and I believe that. And I get all excited and, and thrilled and joyful and tearful and everything else when I think about the glories that are coming. But I also need some stuff for the nasty now and now. That's where I'm living. And my people need that, and the people around me need that. And so I'm not so interested in fancy theories. I'm not so interested in theological arguments or semantic debates. I want something that the Scripture at least alludes to, and then something that can be backed up on the battlefield and will actually produce results in defeating the enemy. Now, when that happens... I don't care what they say. You know, people have had a heyday with my boxes. I mean, in conquering. And as a matter of fact, weren't my boxes anyway. The Lord showed a man in our church that. He didn't show it to me. I got a bunch of smart Alex in my church. They won't, I'm the pastor. I'm supposed to discover all these neat things and tell them. Here they come trotting up here with all these scriptures. Say, Pastor, you probably already seen this scripture, but uh, it says so and so. We used it on that demon and did so and so. I feel like telling them, shut up. I would have thought of that. You know, it's embarrassing to have all these busy people around here. And I uh, sometimes it gets so noisy in here. I run down the hall and hide in my office. I get so ashamed of all the noise and commotion. <laughs> I tell Noah, be sure and put it on the speaker. I don't want to miss a thing. Listen. It's good to have people that are moving, digging in the Word, moving in the battlefield. You can learn from each other. Praise the Lord. Well, the boxes, you know, they had a heyday with that. Oh, uh, and, and, and they really liked it because that's one thing I said I don't have any scripture for. And boy, I mean, they made it just like going to my jugular. Worley's gone, done it this time. Oh, boxes. Who ever heard of boxes? Who ever heard of boxes? Putting demons in boxes. Putting demons in boxes. Oh, I never heard of anything so ridiculous. Well, then, then we had some people from across the country wrote in. One wrote in, said there's a passage in Jude, uh, uh, Job tell, talks about putting them in a bag. And there's one over in Joshua talks about putting the five kings in a cave and putting a guard in front of them and come back and kill them later. Well, now, you say, oh, well, that's good enough for me. 
You see, to me, the Bible doesn't have to spell it out in words of three, uh, one syllable. If it, the principle is in the Bible, if God teaches that principle, then I'm on good ground. If it doesn't violate a Bible principle, and yet I can't find scripture to back it up, but if it doesn't violate biblical principles, then I'm still on good ground. That's why we have to know this book. We've got to know the Bible. Because it's the place where we try everything out. Now, you may not be able to quote scripture. I've had people say, well, I have to have a scripture for doing this and doing that and doing the other. I said, just as soon as you tell me your scripture for your piano, your carpet on the floor, your pews, your pulpit, your Sunday school literature, having your Bible and pages instead of a scroll, like it's supposed to be. I mean, you want it just like Jesus had it, don't you? And have it in Greek instead of English. See, there's no scripture for that. But everything I've mentioned, there's nothing wrong with them either. They've been useful. They've been utilized. And it doesn't violate anything that God tells us to do or not to do to have these things. Now, I mention this because you're going to run into a lot of real smart folks. They've never done deliverance in their life, but they don't know a thing. But there's nothing they don't know about it. And uh, they can tell you all the things you're doing wrong. You might take the stance I have. People come along and say, you're not doing that right. I said, oh, really? How do you do it? Oh, it's your place. Well, we don't do it, but that's certainly no way to do it. Well, I say, well, I like the way we're doing it better than you like the way you're not doing it. At least we're getting something done. You're doing nothing but criticizing. They're sitting in the seat of the scornful, you see. If they've got a better answer, I'll listen to them. If it, if it, really, if it really is scriptural, if it'll, it'll work and do the job, fine. So the fragmented soul is a relatively new concept, at least to us, and evidently uh, considering the explosive nature of the bombs that go off everywhere we drop it, uh, it must be new to a lot of other people too. But as I said, you see, deliverance is an unfolding revelation. It's not finished. And deliverance is only the stepping stone into something else God's getting us ready for. Now, I don't pretend to know all that it's about. I'm too busy trying to learn what we're doing for the next step to worry a whole lot about what's up yonder. It'd probably scare the daylights out of me if I knew anyway. So God in mercy just keeps me concentrating on learning how to do this step right. And then, oh, there's another one. Well, let's see. Let's go with it. And see, God is taking us a little bit of time. And he's leading us deeper. And, revel and deliverance is not an end in itself. It's a, it's a step along the way to what God is doing to free his people and get them ready for the climactic battle of the ages. And I believe he's going to do a quick work in these days. Uh, in my, uh, just from what I know about the world situation and everything else, he's going to have to do a quick work before the whole thing comes apart. Or is he going to have, he's going to, have to get some bailing wire and hold her together a little longer because she's really about to pop off the seams. And that excites me because it, it can't be too much longer till we're going to see this thing go. Amen. Now we've all read the 23rd Psalm. Please jot these references down because I'm going to go through them rather rapidly and you, uh, you probably won't have time to look them all up. But if you'll jot them down, you can take them back for future reference. When you're taking scriptures, write the numbers first. And it'll make you easy to remember the book than it is the numbers unless you're one of those disgusting people that can remember everything, you know. Every once in a while you run across somebody like that and that's terrible. But most of us are normal, and, 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 and so by the time I wrote, wrote down the abbreviation for the book, I think chapter what, <laughs> verse what, you know. But then somebody mentioned that in a meeting I was in years ago. It's so simple. You think, well, I would have thought of that, you know. But uh, if you write the numbers down first, then you put the, you'll remember the book longer. All right. The 23rd Psalm has that beautiful verse that we've all read. He restoreth my soul. We read that and it just sounds so religious and so nice, doesn't it, and comfortable. Just kind of like an old shoe. You just slip your foot in it and it just feels so good and comfortable, supportive and everything. We don't have any idea what it means, but, you know, it's nice. It just feels right, you know. And we don't know what it means. A lot of things in God's Word are like that. They just feel comfortable, but we don't really understand the depths of them. And then God comes along and peels off and says, look, this is what's really under there. He restores my soul. Now, we've come to believe 
rather firmly that the soul, we know we're three-part beings. We know we're body, soul, and spirit. And uh, then, of course, we know the body didn't get saved. When we got saved, it's still having some, its share of problems. And the soul, I believe, consists of the mind, the will, and the emotions. And all three of those places are still having some problems. The part of us that got saved, of course, was our spirit. And that's where the Holy Spirit is. And this is the thing that will dissolve the problem where the demons are. They're in the soul and in the flesh. That's where they are. Now, the uh, for the believer, because the spirit is sealed off. I won't go into that right now. But at any rate, the soul, he restoreth my soul. That means he restores my mind, my will, my emotions. Well, I wouldn't restore them if they didn't need restoring. If you go to the Strong's Concordance, and you need definitely to have one. If you don't have one, you can get one here. We've got them. Uh, everybody ought to have one. Because you can look up, you can go right back to the, and look up exactly what something meant in the original Hebrew or Greek. It's not, it's not difficult at all. Anybody that can read can learn to use the strongest concordance. And you can go back and find the exact meaning of a word that was used in the translation that you're using. So I looked up restored. I thought, well, I wonder what that could mean. Guess what? It means just what you thought it did. It means to bring back something that has been taken away and put it back into the place from which it's been taken. You say, well, that's elementary. I know, but think about it a minute. He restores my mind, will, and emotions, which have been taken out of place, and they're over here, and he puts them back where they belong. Now, uh, oh, several workshops back, Norman Parrish came in here from Guatemala, and he dropped a real bomb in our laps, and he said the witches in Guatemala are able by their witchcraft and their curses to pull the souls out of people put them in jars and seal them up put them on shelves they store them in a warehouse well now that was pretty <coughs> hard to <coughs> take you know that didn't match up with any psychological theories I ever read and uh, or anything else you know and, and that gets a little spooky when you get to thinking about it and of course I was thinking well you know the mind will and emotion now if you take those out you just have a hull left it's like taking the peanut out and leaving the hull you know and um, so I thought, how could you take the soul out? And he said, you know, that the witches had a degree of control from complete to partial control of those people because of having their soul in a jar. Of course, he didn't bother to go into details. He just dropped it on us and then left. And we had to wrestle with the problem. What in the thunder is going on here? And... I, I, I couldn't quite get it because I thought, well, if you take the soul out, there's nothing left. Just the flesh, you know. That didn't, that, that's, I can't quite get around it. I didn't doubt what he said because I'd been around witchcraft enough to know they can do a lot of things we don't know about. And then in Psalm 7-2, we saw a verse we'd read dozens of times. It never did say what it said that day, though. Lest he tear my soul... Like a lion, lest he tear my mind, will, and emotions like a lion, rending it in pieces. Did you ever see a movie or anything of a lion eating? Lest he tear, he gets hold, he has, he has fangs. You know, he doesn't have any chewing teeth, he just has teeth to rip and to tear. He tears off great chunks. Lest he tear my soul like a lion rending it in pieces now that's what a lion does he sets his claws he hangs into that piece of meat and then he bites chunks out of it and swallows them lest he tear my mind will and emotions into fragments literally rending it in pieces this is where the idea of the fragmented soul comes around but this one really caught my eye while there is no one to deliver deliver yeah, that's why he could do it. See, there was nobody on guard. While there was none to deliver is the time when the soul is fragmented. You can mark it down. Now, when I was born into the world, my mother and father were both Christians. And they went to a church. They had a pastor. 
but and my father of course was my spiritual head and my spiritual authority but he didn't know anything about demons let alone the fragmented soul he knew a little about salvation but in the church where he went of course there wasn't any teaching on deliverance so he knew nothing about binding and loosing there's a lot of things like that you see so and my mother second in command she didn't know either their pastor didn't know of course because he hadn't been taught either and so when I was born into the world there was no one to deliver you see what I'm getting at does that sound like you yes sir what I'm getting at now now don't panic <laughs> because the devil uh, God puts in some built in protections to protect us against our ignorance and our insufficiency otherwise we'd be wiped out and nothing flat but even so there are places where the devil gains an advantage because there's none to deliver see deliverance is essential people with the knowledge of deliverance the essentials of the deliverance message of the authority and power of Jesus name and binding and loosing these are not optional they're absolutely essential I believe we'll have a new generation of children coming up in deliverance workers homes who have learned to bind and loose it, it can't it just can't hardly keep from ha- happening can it I mean could, they, they'd have to have a better chance because from the time they're conceived in our church when a, uh, when a young lady uh, becomes pregnant she and her husband they're right down here for deliverance several services they want to be when they find out she's pregnant they want to be sure all those demons are taken care of they will get as many out as possible Give that baby the maximum chance. We even had uh, a demon speak out of a baby here. The lady was carrying uh, her child, and she came up was in deliverance, and the demon in the baby spoke out and said, "We are going to keep her awake." He said, "We'll teach her to pray for a baby. We'll teach her to ask God for a baby." He said, "We're going to keep that baby's going to cry and keep them up all night long. They're going to hate this baby." Because we're going to torment that baby and keep it crying all the time. And that thing was in the baby already. I have news for you. It went on a vacation. (laughs) But I'm telling you, you see, while there's none, and that's why it's so essential to have the knowledge of deliverance around in your churches, in your pastors. It's a matter of survival in this spiritual warfare we're in. Now, lest he tear my soul like a lion rending it in pieces while there's no one to deliver and look at the churches that have no cover whatsoever when it comes to deliverance when it comes to salvation praise the Lord their own it comes to the baptism of the Holy Spirit praise God there with it a lot of other good sound fundamental truths and they're right on but there's a terrible gap and an opening there there is none to deliver and there's no way they can take proper precautions to protect now let me hasten to say this because of many churches and their emphasis on scripture their emphasis on biblical preaching and the inerrancy of scripture and the virgin birth and the fundamentals of the faith this has a deterring effect even though they don't understand why it's having so much power against the enemy and so we can't say they don't have any protection we just say they ha- there is an opening there it, their protection is not as complete as it could be and as we're learning how to make our own protection we haven't gotten there yet either but we've learned some things and if we're just learning the others had not got started yet now he tears my soul like a lion rending it in pieces the fragmented soul now why is the devil so intent on tearing the soul rending it in pieces why would he bother why go to so much trouble very vital reason Deuteronomy 6 5 Deuteronomy 6 5 tells us that we should love the Lord our God with all our heart with all our soul with all our might Jesus repeated that verse in Luke 10 27 that we should love the Lord our God with all our heart with all our soul and with all our might you see it's with the soul out of the soul that we love the Lord in Luke 146 Mary said my soul doth magnify the Lord 
We magnify the Lord, we love the Lord out of our mind, will, and emotions. Now are you beginning to see the devil's strategy. By fragmenting the soul, by stealing away a part of the soul, by various devices, he is able to restrict how much worship and love is possible for the believer to give back to God. So you see, it's a very valuable prize for the devil. He can't stop people from getting saved. He can hinder them, but he can't really stop them. So the next best thing is to keep God from having full worship, full love, full magnification from his creature that he has redeemed. Now, for example, if you were involved in a lot of things that, where the devil managed to fragment, say, half of your soul, you say, half? Half? Oh, yes, that's, I think that's quite common. I think some people have less than that. Because of various things, some of them they're responsible for, some of them they had nothing to do with. Some of them were put on them by other people. But supposing you had 50% of your soul, your mind, will, and emotions, and when you get saved, you want to love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul. You want to magnify the Lord. And you go into high gear. I mean, you push your full throttle, wide open, praise the Lord. But you see, your full throttle is only 50% of what you're really capable of. Why? Because the enemy has come in and stolen away ahead of time. And so God is cheated out of 50% of the worship, the love, the adoration, the magnifying that you would do. And I'm not saying you're not doing all you're capable of. You're, you're letting all, you pull out all the stops. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And all that. But because the enemy has stolen away a great part of your ability, you see. Now do you see why the devil wants to grab hold of your soul? Also, this throws light, too, on the fact, of the fact that, the, that you're saved, the Spirit is what's saved. Otherwise, the devil would have that gone, too. And, you know, we sing, thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Well, that's right. But uh, my perspective on the soul and what, what really is talking about is different from what it was when I used to sing those songs. Got to get the soul saved. That's true, but uh, you never, the Spirit is the first, first mark. Then the, then the Lord starts the reconstruction of the soul from there. See, the Holy Spirit moved into your spirit. I suppose, I hope you all know that. Maybe I better back up there. Maybe somebody that's a little vague on that. Uh, or at least, I'm not dogmatically saying this. This is just what we believe has happened. We believe the body was not saved when you got saved. If yours was saved, I want to see the perfection of it. I don't want to see a blemish. I don't want to have an ache or pain in it. Not if it's saved, you know. But And then your mind, is it always think right since you got saved? Well, you're born again. You mean your mind goes straying even in spite of that? Oh, yeah. That's why it says pull down imaginations. All right. And your will, oh, you're always, you're good on that, aren't you? You always will to do the right thing, don't you? No? Sorry crowd here. All right. Um, but emotionally, you're all right. I mean, you never pop your cork anymore, do you? Never get upset, jittery, angry. Never fly off the handle. But you're safe. See what I'm pointing out? These three areas of your soul are not saved. They're under reconstruction. But the Holy Spirit came into your spirit. And that's where the new man is. That helps us with that troublesome verse in 1 John that says the new man sinneth not. That's because he's in a sinless environment. When the Holy Spirit moves into place, he cleans her up. See, people get all bent out of shape, you know, and say, Huh? How can I have an old nasty demon? I'm, I'm saved. I'm saved. I said, it's in your soul. It's in your flesh. Your spirit can be all right. Now, we believe that the, we have reason to believe that the soul is located somewhere at the base of the brain, top of the spinal cord. And say, where in thunder did you get that? Well, that's third worldly 514. And you you don't have to believe that if you don't want to. But uh, anyhow, you don't know where it is either. But we have reason to believe it may be in somewhere in that area. That's, a, that's sort of a control area for the whole body. 
But at any rate, wherever it is, that's where the Holy Spirit went in. Um, you say, you got any scripture for that? Oh, yeah. I wouldn't want to come out without my guns loaded. Uh, in 2 Corinthians one twenty-two, and there's a parallel verse in Ephesians 1, 13, 14. 2 Corinthians one twenty-two, Ephesians 1, 13, 14. It says we are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise who is the earnest of our inheritance. Now earnest, of course, is a legal term. Uh, We still use it today in our laws because it came from Roman law through English common law down to our own laws. And when you go to buy a piece of property or something involving a considerable amount of money, you will be required to bind a contract by putting down what is called earnest money. Does anybody know what happens to earnest money if you don't keep the terms of the contract? You lose the money, don't you? You forfeit that earnest money. That earnest or earnest money guarantees you'll keep the terms of the contract. When God saved you, he put down the Holy Spirit as the guarantee that he would keep his promises. You talk about security, that's better than the First National Bank, I'll tell you that. It's better than anything you've ever heard tell of. He is the earnest of our... And and it says he became... He was the seal. Sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. I I thought about that and I got so excited when I thought that the Lord didn't put an angel to seal my soul. Now he got lots of angels. He might decide that one was expendable. Oh, well, let that one go. That one's sealed, whirly. Oh, we don't need that angel anyway. All right. We don't need that earnest. Don't pick up on that one. I can never believe, though, that he'd let go of the Holy Spirit, can you? He wanted us to know how sure things were, how positive it really was. And uh, you say, well, how long does that seal last? Well, it tells us in Ephesians 4.30, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. It lasts until Jesus redeems us. That kind of takes care of everything in between, doesn't it? And he's on guard. Now, from the enemy side, of course, uh, we were dealing with demons, and a uh, demon flared at me and said, uh, you can just knock it off. He's not entitled to deliverance. He's lost. You preach deliverance is bread for the children, and that's right. He's not entitled to it. He's lost. I said, he told me he's saved. I don't care what he told you. He's lost. He's not born again. I said, told me, that's Jesus. I said, I don't care, Worley. He's not saved. We're taking him to hell. I said, well, I still think you're lying. I said, I'll tell you what, you're in, a good, you're in a good position on there. I said, why don't you, I want you to do something for me. I said, I want you to look across there and tell me what you see on the spirit. He said, I don't want to talk about that. I said, oh, but I do. Of course, I had the whip hand, you see. And uh, so we put the pressure on him and finally said, all right. There's a seal there. You're satisfied. You know, it's funny. Demons are always wondering if I'm satisfied. You know, I'm, they're, they seem so concerned, you know. Are you satisfied? I said, well, I think this, uh, and this just popped in my head. The Lord had to tell me because I had never even thought about such a thing. And then the, uh, I said, I think there's some writing on there, isn't there? He said, Worley, I told you I don't want to talk about that. I said, yes, but I told you I want to talk about it. <laughs> and so we talked, and he resisted, and then I did some nasty things I wouldn't want to describe, and uh, put him in some pretty hot water, and finally said, all right. I finally told him, I said, maybe you're, are you a dumb spirit or stupid that you can't even read? He said, of course I'm not stupid. Yes, I can read. And so I kept putting the pressure on him, and finally he said, All right. It says sealed under the day of redemption. But he said he'll never enjoy a day of it because every day he lives we're going to tell him he's lost. But, you know, uh, he said, now are you satisfied? I said, well, almost. I said, but before you leave, (laughs) I said... uh, I want you to do one more thing for me. I want you to reach across and touch the seal. I wish you could have seen the reaction. It was a, it was a sight to behold. The color, of the man I was dealing with, the color drained out of his face, and he just began to shake. He almost shook off of the bench. He was just sitting there. And he just shook from head to toe, 
And that demon looked at me with such hatred and he called me some choice names I won't repeat. And he said, blankety blank, you worry. Oh, I hate you. Said, you know we can't touch that sin. I said, yeah, I knew that, but there's some believers standing around here and they didn't know it and I wanted you to tell them. <laughs> Thanks a lot. And those believers said, oh, did you hear that? They can't touch it. That's right. Friend, if they can't touch it, they can't undo it. You don't know where it is because you can't get to it. And God says she'll stick on there till the day of redemption. How's that? Now, a few months later, I was over in another place, someplace, and I was dealing with a demon and a world ruler, and he was kind of upset with me. Most of the demons I meet are upset. Uh, I talk to them quiet and gentle and everything, trying to keep, keep them calm, but they get all upset. And he said, um, I tell them a lot of times, I said, why don't we just have a friendly little chat? One of them said, there's no such thing with you. I said, I've heard about you. I said, no matter where you start, we always have to leave. <laughs> That's a good reputation to have, isn't it? Praise the Lord. I don't talk to demons for no reason. I always have a reason. They know. Some of the critics don't know, but they know. The demons know. They know why I'm talking to them. They tell me, I'm not talking to you. One of them told me, said, I'm not talking to you, Worley. Demons will talk to you, get in trouble. I got enough trouble already. <laughs> well, I sent him on vacation so he could rest. <laughs> But anyhow, this other this world ruler I hang, hung into, and he looked at me, and he was oh, he was just raging at me, and he said, "You think you're so smart, Worley?" I said, "Well, that answer stands young." He said, "Oh, shut up! You know it won't." He said, "I'll tell you something you don't know, fat man." <laughs> now that hurt me. <laughs> That's one of the nicer things they call me. Uh, from there on, it goes, it goes downhill pretty fast. But anyway, he said, I'll tell you something you don't know. He said, he said we can't touch. He said, you're always going around the country telling people we can't touch the seal. He said, I'm sick of it. I said, oh, you noticed. He said, of course. I said, well, isn't it true? He said, well, of course it's true, but you don't have to go shoot your mouth off about it. Said you're such a blabbermouth, Worley. Said you just tell everything. <laughs> he said, but I'll tell you something you don't know. You think you're so smart. He said we can't touch that blankety blank seal, but I'll guarantee you one thing, Worley. We can layer in around it. We don't touch it, but we can layer in around it and choke off the flow of spiritual gifts. Said, oh, this idiot said, oh, he wants to. He wants to pray in tongues, and he wants to prophesy, and he wants to interpret, and all those disgusting things. And said, but we won't let him. We're layered in real tight all around his spirit. Said, he can't do any of those things. I said, really? He said, that's right. Well, now, since I was raised in the South, my mama told me to always be polite and thank people when they help me. And I said, thank you very much. (laughs) He looked kind of startled. And I said, Father... I think we're going to need some angels with crowbars come in here and pry up these layers. And and he said, you can't do that. You can't do that. I said, I just did. And sure enough, you know, those angels came to those wrecking bars and they started prizing up those layers. And they just did a real good job. He's flowing pretty good when we left. See, that's one of the reasons why these things are happening. Why people can't get assurance of salvation. Why they can't flow in the things of the Lord, though they deeply yearn and desire for it. It's because of the work of the enemy. Well, the soul. Uh, now remember this: the Holy Spirit moves into our spirit, and from the spirit, He is directing the reconstruction of the whole being. He's working on the mind. That's why you think a little better than you used to. Not much, but a little. You know. And. Uh, he's working on your will. That's why you, you're, you're making some success in those areas where you used to fail all the time. Uh, he's making, he's, he's working on your emotions to get them straightened out so that you're doing better now than you were. You still have your ups and downs, but you, you're succeeding now once in a while. What a refreshing change that is. And he's working on the old body. See, you ought to be in better shape in every way as the Lord begins to do this. Now, sometimes you'll think you're having a real relapse. 
because a lot of times as God is is, un, is peeling these demons off and they're there in layers just like layers of an onion and then they just he just keep peeling them off and peeling them off. and then you expose fresh layers and that's when they wow they come up and you think oh my lands this is worse than I ever was well no that one was just hidden all the time you didn't know about him some of these others you knew about you see so don't get discouraged when they start flaring say hallelujah smoked you out huh Got you out in the open. Yeah. That's what's happening. All right. Now let's go back again to the fragmented soul. The devil comes in and by various means he steals away parts. I'm going to drop you a few scriptures, not many, because and I'm sure there are many more. As I said, this is just a beginning study. And I hope you'll go into the Word and find it out and run the references and dig out even more verses. And if you get a hold of some, send them to us. We'll compile them, get them all together. And make them available to workers everywhere. I mean, when you when you when you find a treasure, share it. I get so aggravated. You know, I I, I know of, um, some deliverance people that have some precious truths, but they won't write them down. You have to buy it on tapes. And you know, a book is a lot cheaper easier to use in a lot of ways you see and I don't know I kind of get angry a little bit about that because I think well you know if you got something good from the Lord share it put it where the people can get to it where the workers can use it one of the blessed things is to get get the thing moving I don't care I, I, I don't want everybody to have to come to Chicago and get delivered my lands what a disaster that would be I mean, we've been shuttling them off there. All you workers, we can find out. If we find out you're a worker, we, we'll load you up. You let us know your telephone number. You've had it. And when they call in here, we pull the zip code file. Say They say, we're coming to Chicago. I say, where are you located? And they tell me, I say, what's your zip code? We go to the zip code file and we check and we have a pink card in there. I say, wait a minute. No use making all the expensive trip to Chicago. Try these folks. They're in deliverance nearby. They're a lot closer than we are. Use the same methods, know the same God. They're they're effective, and try them out. Every once in a while, we pull some out of our pile too. We find out somebody's found a better way. They're now counseling them out. We don't have to go through all that. So we just quietly pull their card, and we don't recommend them anymore. If you notice the book, the list in the book changes. If you've noticed. Every the, we're reprinting, demolishing right now, because we're down to less than a thousand copies of them, and uh, we're reprinting that now. And the the list has changed a lot. There's been a lot of dropouts, but we've added on a bunch too. And if you are a worker and should be in there and are not, please let us know. We'll try to get get you some business. If you don't have anything to do, we'll load you up. I mean, just about everybody calls here. They don't call me, they call Steve, so praise the Lord. Let me give you some scriptures right quick. Proverbs 6, 32, 33. Whoso commits adultery with a woman lacketh understanding. He that doeth it destroyeth his own mind, will, and emotions. A wound and a dishonor shall he get, and his reproach shall not be wiped away. Listen, the damage done by sexual sin is not apparent on the surface a lot of times. And it doesn't seem to be bothering anybody, but the Bible says you destroy your soul by this. One of the ways, one of the one of the ways that the devil fragments the soul is through wrong sex. All right. Now, First Thessalonians two eight, Paul says, "We were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because you were dear to us." We were willing to have imparted unto you. They already imparted the gospel, but said we were willing not only to impart the gospel, but even our own souls, minds, will, and emotions. Now, I don't pretend to know what that means exactly. How can you impart a soul? I think it refers to a super strong soul tie. I think, and this is this is an area I'd like you to research and study, and let us know what you find out about it. But there is a there is a way in which those who are close to you can impart things about their mind, will, and emotions to you. Now, how this is done exactly, the mechanics of it, 
I don't know, but something passes from them to you. Maybe it's transfer spirits, or I know they can be inherited and so forth, but it, it's in the soulish area where this happens. Now, now, it can be done for good, too. Because actually, if you're in a past, under a pastor, he will do just like Paul. He'll impart part of himself to you. I know you can transfer the gifts to the people. Because, you see, everything Jesus did could be taught to the disciples or imparted to them. Be, be skeptical and scared of all these strange things that go on, supposedly, of the Lord, but nobody else can do them. Everything Jesus did could be either, either be taught to the disciples or imparted to them by laying on of hands. And so, uh, be skeptical of the other kind. Um, they're flashing lights at me. I'm going to have to hurry. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 2.8 needs more study. But there is a sense in which the soul or soulish spirits or whatever can be imparted to another person. Because, notice Paul said the reason they could do this is because they were dear to them. This is extremely close. The soul tie exchange. And this can be done for good or for evil. You have to realize these things, a lot of them are for good or for evil. And the devil makes them in. In Ezekiel 13, the latter half of the chapter discusses witches who are hunting the souls of the righteous to make them fly. If you look up the word hunt, you'll find it means just that. Just like you go out and hunt birds. Well, that's what they were doing. They were hunting. And they were not hunting birds, though. They were hunting the souls, mind, will, and emotions, of the righteous, not the unsaved. But the righteous were the objects, the targets. If you think you're safe from witchcraft, you've got another thing coming. You're the target. They hunt the souls of the righteous to make them fly. And I thought, well, maybe the translators... Maybe there's words have changed or something since 1611. So I went to the concordance. Guess what? Fly means just what it says. It means to go through the air like a bird. To go through the air like a bird? My, my, my. He restoreth my soul. He puts back that which has gone to another place and puts it back where it belongs. See the connection? Witchcraft is able to remove parts of the soul, mind, will, emotions. And uh, it talks about pillows, which are amulets, and, uh, and their kerchiefs, which are used in their demon worship, to hunt the souls of the righteous, to make them fly. Study that chapter carefully. You'll find out that believers are the special target of witchcraft. And God's against all that. And then uh, Acts 15.24 says, Certain went out from us, certain who went out from us, have troubled you with words, subverting your souls. And this was the legalistic Judaizers who went in behind Paul and the others who had established churches, and they came in teaching other doctrines, and they came in teaching a different plan of salvation, saying it's not enough just to be saved. You have to do this, you have to do that, you have to do the other. And so consequently, they, uh, they subverted the souls, the mind, will, and emotions of the people with words. You don't need to listen to all the garbage in the country. A lot of people think, I, I've run across preachers and, the, and they'd have people in their church who were just trash. You know, I mean, speakers. They'd have, oh, well, they came through and they called and said, I felt led to... I have a, they don't do it anymore. I think word must have circulated. That old grizzly bear over at that church, he won't let nobody in. Uh, they called me and said, I just felt led to tell you I have a message for your church. I said, you do? Yeah, we're traveling through. And I said, well, let me have your phone number and I'll pray about it. If the Lord tells me you have a message, I'll call you back. I didn't even write the number down. You say, well, how ugly. Well, it was ugly of them to call. I don't know them from Adam's off fox. They may be the devil's best right arm trying to get into my church. Get, get among my sheep. You think I'm going to turn a wolf or a loose among my sheep? You've got another thing coming. No way. I'm usually pretty peace-loving, but if somebody gets to mess with my sheep, they're in trouble. I'll fight them over then. In Second Peter 2.14... Second Peter 2.14, the soul can be beguiled, have a spell cast on it. 
And this is the explanation for the cults and all the charismatic witchcraft and other kinds of witchcraft you see working in churches where they're running under mind control and soul power instead of the Holy Spirit. And they don't know the difference because they've been beguiled. And it talks about beguiling unstable souls. That's 2 Peter 2.14. Unstable souls are those that are not grounded in this word, the word of God, and they're not stabilized because they haven't learned how to appropriate the word and to let the living word come forth out of them as the Holy Spirit teaches them and trains them. Now, the soul can be beguiled, and then there's a good, there's a nice one in First Peter one twenty two that's encouraging. The soul can be purified. Isn't that encouraging? It says, purifying your souls by obeying the truth through the Spirit. Now the truth, what is the truth? If we're going to obey the, uh, it says you can purify your souls by obeying the truth. Jesus said in John seventeen seventeen, sanctify them in truth. Set them apart in truth. Thy word is truth. We can be set apart by truth. And this will purify our souls. And we'll be able to obey the truth, which is here. The only way we can do that is through the Spirit, because the Holy Spirit will ride roughshod over those demons. He'll give you the ability to do what God says. You're not ever going to be able to outmaneuver them yourself. But God, the Holy Spirit, will do that. Obeying the truth through the Spirit, through the Holy Spirit power of the spirit and what will this produce the unfeigned love of the brethren it's just it's just as clear as a bell you obey you can purify your souls by obeying the truth through the spirit and this in turn will produce an unfeigned love of the brethren you can't help loving the people jesus loves when your soul gets purified if you kind of that one of those (laughs) he Well, she sure doesn't look right. Wonder why he came. You know, if you've got that kind of attitude, you you wouldn't say it out loud because that wouldn't be very religious. It's very important that we be religious and uh, nice. But inside, if you feel those little negative things nipping and you know, well, there's no reason for me to feel that way, you know. And you're so class conscious, you know. Well, they're just not in our class. You know, I don't know what kind of class you are. What kind of pit were you dug out of? <laughs> you say, oh, well, I wasn't in the pit. Well, you can be an up and outer or a down and outer, but you all got to come through the same door. If you're up and outer, you got to slide down to it. If you're down and outer, you come up to it, you know. But you still go through the same door, Jesus Christ. Amen? If you're down and outer, wallowing in the gutter, you say, oh, that's terrible. But if you're an up and outer in the church... You're in much more danger because you might get you, you come near getting lost there than anyplace else. One of the most dangerous things in the world is to be lost in the church, to be in the midst of the gospel but not have it in you, to be among the disciples but not be one of them. That's why Judas what he tried. He even got the treasurer's job. <laughs> uh, it always amuses me, you know, because really. When it came to the Last Supper, you remember? Now, Peter, the way the way Peter was, if he'd had any inkling, it was Judas. You think he'd have said, is it I? Well, he'd say, huh, I've been suspicious of Judas all along. <laughs> Why, he'd have never accused himself. Peter thought a lot of himself. He'd like you and me. He'd have never said, is it I, Lord, if he'd thought it was Judas. Nobody but Jesus knew. So I guess you just might as well quit checking yourself.